Hmm. I'm not sure what I just did. What did I do? Hmm. 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 I'm not sure. Oh, great. What did I do? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Switch to active speaker. <sighs> okay. Hi. Let's see. Can you hear me? You can. Okay. My voice is sounding awful today. I don't know how this is going to go. We'll see. <laughs> okay. Hmm. How come I can see everybody but me? Well, I don't know. Camera on. Virtual background. Hmm. This time it's different. I have a waiting room and I've never had that before. So. Hmm. Mute. Participants. <clears throat> Video. Okay. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Yes. So my voice is a little off today. I'm sorry. I think I've just been talking a lot over the last couple of weeks. So I don't know. It just started to disappear a little bit on me today. So I'll do my best. Um, let's see. We'll give everybody a few more minutes. We're going to do it a little different today. I was going to just start off with some basic things with kittens, and it doesn't really have to be about orphan kittens. It can be about any age kittens, um, birth all the way to even two years, two years of age, because we still don't see social maturity in the cat until close to two anyway. So I can answer, I'm going to kind of leave it as a lot of a Q&A because I've been getting a lot of emails with questions. So I wanted to be able to answer those things too, because I think all of these questions are really good. So I'm going to do my best. I have my coffee here to help with my throat because I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm fine. I'm just starting to lose my voice. Huh. I'm trying to see, I think that you guys can type. Yeah, there you go. So there's that chat at the bottom. And as we're talking, if you guys want to type questions, I'm going to get to a point where I just start answering your questions and we make it more of a, you know, just kind of a visit because I think that'll help at least. There's just so, this is such a wide topic. It's such a large topic, kittens. Um, my favorite topic, but it's a large one. So I want to make sure that I get all of your questions answered. But um, first of all, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Um, the main reason I wanted to do kittens is because, I don't know, I just thought that it was a great topic to talk about for Mother's Day since kittens are, you know, they all have moms and I don't know, it's just a fun little topic. So 
if all of you guys are there and able to hear me, let me make sure I don't have anybody in the waiting room. I didn't even know I had a waiting room. Let's see. And some people might join a little bit later as we go. So that's fine too. But we're gonna start talking about kittens. So kittens are, again, my favorite topic because I think that what we do with these guys as kittens, what they're exposed to, what we know about them, and as much as we can learn about them and their parents is what sets them up to be great cats and also to be great pet cats. And the, the biggest thing that we face in the world of feline medicine that makes us very different is in essence, the cat was one of the last of the domestic species to be domesticated. And among, you know, feline behaviorists, the question is still, was the cat ever really domesticated? Or was that something that just happened alongside human nature? And I think that there's valid arguments on both sides of those points and both sides of the coin. And, you know, in practice, and the more I've done with kittens from studying my own feral cat population, to dealing with kittens since basically 1996 and bottle raising, all these things, what I've learned is that, you know, I see some cats that I truly feel are quite suitable and domesticated for the home. And then I see those cats that no matter what, no matter how great the handler was and no matter how great the, um, you know, just the people around these kittens were, they still don't make the best pet cats. And there's a lot of whys, why is that? Mm -hmm. So ultimately, if we go back about 10,000 years ago from, and even earlier than that, you'll learn that the, where the cat came in, they're, they're past even the water buffalo as far as mm -hmm. socialization and domestication. Where they came in was when the human's lifestyle went from that hunter lifestyle where everybody was hunting and, you know, gathering their food that way to the more gatherer lifestyle when we started building crops, maintaining grains and those things. And because that happened, there came the mice. And when the mice came into play, there came the cats. And so it's sort of that symbiotic relationship with the cat where they never saw, they never really were bred. They were never genetically selected like the dog, the horse, the cow, all of those animals were genetically selected for a purpose. Whereas the cat came in and said, just like they often do, no man, you're not going to genetically select me. I'm going to come on in and I'm going to choose to be around you and I'm going to stay with you as long as you provide me mice. And then when you don't, I'm going to exit the scene. So I don't know. I still see that. And I have some feral barn cats that live at my house and they're feral in the sense that I cannot physically still touch them after five years of feeding and loving them. But as long as there's mice, as long as there's birds, as long as there's hay, they're going to stay. And so I think that's kind of along the same lines, whereas some of my, you know, I do have my pedigree cat, Millie, who's a Persian, she's 20, you know, those are, those are the cats that were sort of beginning, and, and we are, I think, through breeding programs and through purebreds, and that's where you're starting to see the selection for temperament and all of those sorts of things. So Millie is a Persian, so she came in and she is 100% suitable. She loves to be around, you know, me. She loves to be around my husband. She like she's not freaked out by the noises of the house, whereas some of my other cats are. So I think that the horizon and the future is really cool in feline medicine. And I think over the next thousands of years, we're going to see some really neat things with the cat. But the most important thing is, is I think right now they're the species that is teaching us. We think we're teaching them, but I think it's the role reversal. I think that the cat's teaching us. So with, with kittens, we'll just touch on the, the beginning, the basics, and then I want you guys to feel free to ask away. But the, role, the life of a kitten starts in utero. It starts the day mom conceives and the day mom is pregnant. And what I mean by that, and we know this through studies in the mouse, and now we know it through studies in the human and the cow, 
and now we're seeing it through studies in the feline, is that prenatal stress is very, very important to the development of these fetuses and unborn kittens. And it really does shape the potential for these guys to exist in the world. And so what I mean by that is I'm going to give you a scenario. So mom, mama cat's pregnant, tomcat, maybe resources are a little thin for her. Maybe she's, you know, hunting. The average cat's going to hunt up to 100 times a day. They're going to kill maybe six to eight mice, but they're going to have fun hunting. Well, maybe mom's not getting that. Maybe she doesn't have supplemental food and maybe she's not getting nearly the nutrition she needs. So inside her hormones, her cortisol levels are going to be elevated because of stress. Maybe she can't hide. Maybe there's a lot of dogs or foxes, fox dens around or coyotes. So now we have a, a poor nutrition mom that can't hide. So her cortisol levels are up. Those cortisol levels go to the placenta. And those hormones in utero affect those developing fetuses, even so much as the development to the point where some of these guys will be born with less hair than they should be, less fuzz. They'll be born developmentally behind, okay? Not only that, but they automatically have an innate decreased threshold for stress just by what we call the epigenetics. So that's not their genetics. Genetics are what's passed down from the mom and the dad. But epigenetics are those factors that come in once the genetics are, are mixed and once those kittens are des destined to be boy, girl, black coat, calico, torty. The epigenetics are what is mom feeling while I'm pregnant and what is that affecting my development in utero, okay? So we may have kittens that genetically should be good temperaments because mom and dad were handleable. But if mom was stressed, then those kittens are like, okay, my hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access is different. The neurochemicals I release is different. I have an inadequate stress and coping mechanism. So when I'm born, I'm already predetermined to be a little high strung or a little anxious. And that has to do with some of the things mom went through. So a lot of those factors, guys, we can't control. We don't know what these, we, we get these kittens as orphans, we get them young. But I think, you know, when you, when you have the privilege of, of owning or caring for a pregnant mom, that is where you can do a big job in setting these guys up to have as best of a stress response as possible. And I actually have at the end, when I send you guys emails, I actually have a typed up paper that I wrote on how I can decrease perinatal and prenatal stress in moms. So you guys are gonna get that. But then you have these kittens that are birthed, okay? And maybe they're birthed in the wild, you know, out in the outdoors. And maybe mom again is stressed. A stressed mom is gonna move her kittens a lot. And in the first week, especially to two weeks, the kittens, you know, they don't see and they don't hear, right? So they can only go, they are born smelling. They have an immediate olfactory and an immediate tactile sense. So they detect mom's milk and mom and the teat that they're going to choose to nurse on, they're going to detect that by heat, thermal, and they're going to detect it by smell. And usually by a couple of days, it's amazing. A, a kitten will have a preferred teat that it will nurse on, and it will pretty much stay true to that, and it will even fight off its little mates to stay away from its preferred teat. So when these moms, you know, they're moving the kittens a lot. So again, the group smell is gone. So now in the postnatal period, we have stressed kittens. And that's when we find a lot of these orphans is when mom's moving them. All of a sudden you see a random kitten and you see no mom. And that is because likely she was moving her kittens for some perceived threat, whether it's a real threat. Remember we talked about this in the last, a perceived threat and a real threat is one in the same to a cat. So that's where we find these orphans. But anyway, so they're born. Well, what happens to the cat, the critical sensitive period for the cat is two to seven weeks. That is the most important part for socialization, 
and for habituation. And those are two separate terms in the sense that socialization means, am, am I handled? Am I okay that you're with? Am I okay that you're, let me let some more people in the Zoom meeting. It means socialization means, am I okay with people touching me? Am I okay with humans? Am I okay with dogs? Am I okay with children? And then habituation means, am I suited to life as a pet? Do, do the noises of the TV scare me? Am I habituated to noises over time? Am I habituated to the ice dropping? You know how everybody has those cats where they adopt and then all of a sudden the ice drops and they jump. Those are the things that matter in those first two to seven weeks. And then after two to seven weeks, the next important phase, why kittens, it's really nice to be able to have them with mom and their litter mates, is because that's where weaning and teaching them that it's okay to be frustrated. It's okay to not be able to get what you want. And then this is how you behave to get what you want. That's what mom teaches them. So that's really important in those next weeks, keeping them healthy. So let's go into a scenario. This is sort of a, a scenario that really puts things into perspective for me. So I have a mama cat that is not used to being in a shelter, okay? And she's TNR'd for whatever reason, or she's caught, or maybe she's brought into the shelter. Well, she's not used to that. That is not her norm. And these are the challenges that we all face, and I don't have necessarily have a good answer on how to fix it, but this is what we're faced with. So mom comes in, she's stressed, she's used to living out, then all of a sudden she's brought into a homing center and she's prepared her kittens for a life via the placenta, via her hormones in utero, for a life of survival in the wild. That means these kittens have a predetermined ability to, they have a decreased stress response, they know that they're supposed to act vigilantly and that sets them up to survive with coyotes, hawks, foxes, and all the predators they're gonna face. But suppose we take that mom and those kittens that are unborn and we put them in a homing shelter, and now those kittens that have a already stress response in development, now all of a sudden those kittens are asked to live in a home with three children, a washer, a dryer, and they're not supposed to be stressed they're, because they're in a home, they're safe, but they already have this stress response that was already genetically and epigenetically predestined to, in them. And now they have a mismatched, maladaptive stress response. And in an environment that they're not supposed to be stressed in, guess what? They're now hypervigilant. And we all have those cats. I have one in my house right now. When I come home from work, if I don't literally change my clothes before I do anything, sometimes Rafe, my little orphan cat, will bite me because I smell different. Or if I have to give him medicine, he's going to literally try to tear me to pieces. And even though I'm doing things in a feline-friendly manner, he's set up to be genetically, because he was from a litter that was very stressed, to be genetically, okay, I need to be a little hypervigilant here. I need to make sure that I'm in charge of things. So there's that mismatch. And so what do we do about it? Because then there's that ethical and moral question we all face. Do we just let them all die? Do we just leave them out there? Do, what do we do? That's the question. I don't know. I don't know. I think that the important thing is, is that from a scientific and genetic background, that we understand the why, and then we do our best to deal with the how. And that's kind of what I do. You take each situation and you say, okay, this is what I have. Am I in a breeding program where I have the ability to make sure that my moms are well fed? They have a good environment. They have multiple resources. They have proper, all the things that we talked about in the last talk to make them a happy cat. And and is that a possibility or am I dealing with um, a trapped mom that is two days away from having a litter of kittens that are already 
selected genetically to live on a farm with a thousand predators. And now I want him to go into a home with three kids, a baby, a washing machine, two other cats and a dog. So I think that's where we can help the situation. And the more we know, you know as well as I do, the more you know and the more you understand brings your compassion level up and your ability to really intervene in a way that is meaningful and that can make a difference. So when I send out my information, the next thing I have for you guys is there's actually um, a kitten socialization checklist from weeks two to seven and what are the things that you can do. So this is really helpful when you're dealing with those little babies and when you're a bottle kitten raiser. And I think it's still helpful. There's no hard, fast rules when you're dealing with the cat. I learned that every day in feline medicine. I think I know something. The cat shows me I don't know anything. I learned that every single day. I think the cat humbles me more than anything in life. And I think, I guess that's why God probably put me in this career. But no hard and fast rules with the kitten. So just because I said the socialization ends between two and seven weeks, I don't think that's hard and fast. So just remember that what you do can make a difference, but that's the science behind why. Those are the whys and the things that we can't control. Those are the genetics. Those are the things that in research, and I, I, you know, I really enjoy reading all of the research that comes out in my monthly journal, but also there's a lot of feline behaviors that are in the UK. And I find that I learn the most from those guys because they've been dealing with studying cats and dealing with the genetics of cats for many, many years. So most of my information and the courses that I take come out of the UK because I find that that's where they do the feral cat studies. That's where they do um, the orphan kitten studies. And, you know, right now, some of the latest research that just came out and a, much, a bunch of these papers are out of Ohio State with um, some of the feline doctors there, but there are two risk factors that we're seeing now, two of the biggest risk factors in cats that are going to become behavioral cases later. And what they're finding is that um, two, let's see if I can get, let's see if saying everybody, some people are in the waiting room. I don't really know how that is, but what it's showing is that two of the biggest factors for behavior issues in the kitten or the cat are going to be orphan, whether they were orphans, and then declawing. Those are kind of our two biggest things that are on the rise now. And what we're seeing is, you know, things that we used to not really think mattered are actually starting to matter now. So I think that um, research is cool, research is new, and I like the things that it brings to the table in feline medicine. So one of the most important phases beyond the kitten phase is up to four months. And that was the whole purpose of kitten kindergarten here at Cat Care Center. And we are gonna get that going as soon as we can. But my intention was, you know, if the socialization period of the cat ends around seven weeks and the habituation period ends shortly around there as well, then what can I do to take these kittens from that eight to nine week period up to maybe 14, 16 weeks and helping make them suitable for a pet cat. And that's where Kitten Kindergarten was born. And there are a lot of states that do Kitten Kindergarten and Baton Rouge soon will too. We're gonna to do that at Cat Care Center. But what it is, is it's a program that takes them from the time they're adopted and it takes them for the next couple of classes. It's, it's a group of classes that's limited to a certain number of kittens, but it's, it's a situation where you take them, you don't force anything on the cat. We've learned that forcing anything from eye medications to oral medications doesn't always end well. So we always have to beg them to let us do them, to let us help you. But what it does is, is it provides the kittens the next step. So where we teach them about the importance of their veterinary visits, but we accustom them to the veterinarian where, you know, I walk around, let them play with my stethoscope, listen to their heart, show them how handling is supposed to be, teach their owners little things that they can do at home to make them coming to the vet and going to other places easier. The other thing is, is there's a group of them. We don't force them to play because at that age, they might still be playing near each other and not so much with each other, 
but some of them will be wanting to play with each other. But guess what that teaches them? It's okay to interact just like puppies with a strange cat that doesn't go home with you. It's okay. You can still interact and go on about your business. It's okay. There's nothing bad that's going to happen. And we teach them to reward that. So that's really cool too. We also teach them how to, um, we prepare them for medications in the future should they need it. So we teach owners, we all owners will get a pill popper and we teach them how to put the lickable treats on there or baby food. And these are all things that you can work with your fosters too with if you do foster kittens or your own cats. Get a pill popper, one of those big pill guns that I use sometimes. Put the treat on there with no medicine because we all know when you put the medicine in there, something happens and they know it's there. So if we maybe if we start training them from early, early on, they really will not realize it's there, of course, unless they sense it because they're a cat and they have all those senses, but it's worth a try, right? So, and I teach this in my kitten visit. So when people come with me for kittens, I'm already prepping them for that. I'm teaching them that, hey, guess what? This is how we need to start teaching them how to take medicine. It's off the end of a lick of a, with a lickable treat off the end of a pill popper and owners can start doing that. We talk about carrier training. We talk about, there are also videos and there are um, noise you can buy on Amazon. I saw it, um, CDs of like the washing machine and babies crying and things like that. So it's shown in research. They've actually done research in homing centers with kittens that had a proper socialization program and then those that didn't. And one of the socializations is also playing noises that they might exhibit in a pet home, that they might meet in a pet home, but starting at the lowest and then raising it gradually over a period of weeks so that they become habituated to the washing machine, the telephone, the doorbell, the crying baby, all those sorts of things. So I tried to do that with some of my kittens when I bottle raise them. I try to get them used to loud noises, you know, different at different points. And I think that it does help whenever we're talking about kittens being one of the orphan kittens in particular, being one of the biggest factors in behavioral um, issues that develop in the future. So, and you know, when it comes to, I do a lot of behavior work, I, I feel like the biggest things I deal with are cats that bite their owners and cats that not as much inappropriate urination as it is attacking and biting their owners. And I find that these cats, it's often redirected aggression from frustration. And it might be from a life that they're not quite set up genetically to live. And that's a hard conversation to have because it all stems back to the science behind what happened to that kitten when that mama was pregnant and what the factors are because they're also in kittens the majority of their ability to be handled by the human comes from the genetics of the dad so even if mom the one that raises them the one that nurses them the one that teaches them is okay with humans but dad was a hundred percent feral and never was allow human touch guess what those kittens have a predisposition to not really want human touch as well. So genetics comes from both parents, predominantly the male. Then the next level comes in what environment the uterine, what uterine environment they exhibited or they felt. And then next comes what was, what was their sensitization period or their socialization period like? What was that two to seven week period like? And then the third thing that makes up their temperament besides genetics, what was their socialization period like? The third thing is going to be what was the what did they experience the first time they experienced the situation in question? So let's say you have a kitten and it sees a dog for the first time. And let's say that you let the dog run up to it. And let's say that kitten perceived that as a threat. So then if it gets around any dogs, it's going to remember that. It's going to pull from those files. It's very quick. It's going to sense, pull from the files, react. So it's going to remember what that first instance was like with the dog. But what if you had the dog on a leash and you had your dog in a down stay and you had control of your dog and that kitten chose to walk up to that dog and the minute that dog started to sniff 
what if you were able to give your dog a collar correction? And then that kitten was like, okay, the dog isn't so bad. So the next time the kitten comes in contact with the dog, it might not feel threatened. It might be like, oh, okay, the last time I met a dog, it was okay. So what I do with Ruby, because I do have a standard poodle and she's big, Ruby's very comfortable with kittens and has always been very comfortable with kittens um, because Ruby has to go, I put her collar on her and she has to go in a down stay around kittens and she has to sit there. And sometimes I make her sit there for 20, 30 minutes when the kittens come and approach her and she loves kittens, but, and I let her play with them eventually, but not until the kittens show me that they're comfortable climbing all over her. And eventually they get that way and then boom, she plays with them. But that initial visit is so important. And I try to tell her that and I give her lots of treats and lots of rewards for letting me correct her when she wants to play with them. But she does. She's required to go in a down stay. She's not allowed to move there. They have to crawl all over her and show that it's okay. And then I, I take the kittens away. And then we slowly do that each time. And then eventually before you know it, the kittens and her are playing and it's, I'm allowed to let her be. But I, you know, that is how my orphans, because my hopes are if their first encounter with a dog is a good one, then guess what? Maybe they're adopted by a family with dogs and maybe they won't be so terrified and hissy and spitty around the dogs. You know, it's just something I can do. I can't control it all, but I can do my part. So, so those are the important factors there. And, um, Again, I think that there's a lot that is out of our control, and that's the most important thing that you should know when you're dealing with kittens. But the things that are in our control are the little things we've talked about here. And it goes down to, you know, one of the biggest, the next biggest thing I have with kittens, and then I'm going to open the floor up to questions, is that people ask me all the time, my kitten plays too rough, Dr. Lucy. It bites me, it scratches, it grabs my ankles, it does all these things, why is it doing that? That is a form of play in the kitten, but it's called predatory aggression because mama probably was not there to teach those kittens how hard it is hard enough and how aggressive is aggressive enough. And I, again, when you're hand rearing kittens and cats, some of the best, if they can't be with their mom until they're 12 weeks to 13 weeks of age, having them with a neutered cat that can act as a surrogate is really good because I can't tell you over the years, Jazzy passed away last um, October, October, and he was 19. And I can't tell you the litter of kittens that cat raised. And he'd come in when I was bottle raising. And then right when they got to that seven to eight weeks of age, they'd start to play with them. And if they bit him, he bit them back and he let them know how hard is too hard. And that was a safe way. I could trust him. I knew he wasn't going to hurt them. He bottle raised many, many litters of kittens with him. That was one of the greatest things about him. And I always find that the neutered male cats are probably the best surrogates. The females kind of are a little bit, shall we say witchy? I don't know. Millie doesn't, she comes kind of bites a little too hard. I'm, I'm, I can think of some of the, the girls on this call whose cats would probably bite a little too hard too. But anyway, those are my thoughts on, on that. So with that being said, I'm going to answer some questions. So the first question that um, I had a couple of questions come in via email. So I'll answer those first and then you guys can type your questions if you want and I'll answer those. But um, somebody asked, is there a difference in temperament, behaviors, or personality of kittens raised by their feline mothers and bottle-fed cats? And yeah, I think that we covered that a little bit. So in terms of temperament, remember, the temperament of the cat is made up of the genetics, which is the mom and the dad, some of the epigenetics, which is what they experienced in utero. Those are the things we can't control. It is then related to what happens between that two to seven week period, maybe up to nine weeks, and then what happens when they're exposed to their litter mates and the mom teaching them weaning, proper weaning, because a lot of behaviors that are um, abnormal that we'll see, and I mean, they're really cute, but they're not normal, are our wool sucker kittens. I had a wool sucker where they got early weaned. They didn't get weaned in the proper fashion by their mom, so they nurse a blanket or they nurse our shirts, or they do something like that. I'm sure all of you guys have come in contact with those. So yes, there is a personality difference. Um, now there are 
socialization programs for bottle fed kittens. And again, you guys are going to get a copy of those, okay, about the checklist of what to do between week, at week two, what to do at week three, what to do at week four, and so on. So you guys are going to get a copy of that. Um, hold on one second, Mom. I have an in-hospital patient and her IV line is missing, so give me a second. Okay, all is well. So that's the answer to that question. And then can you mold a kitten to be a lap sitter or have another behavior if you adopt them when they are young? Um, the answer to that is no. And if you mold them, you're sort of forcing your will on them. They either are a lap sitter like this one in that picture up there, or they are not. You can't make them a lap sitter. And it's really hard to determine who's going to be a lap sitter and who's not. Um, I think that I have some disappointed owners sometimes because they get a kitten and they want they wanted a lap sitter and it won't sit on my lap and I pick it up and I make it sit on my lap and I'm clawed to death and I'm like, yeah, you're gonna be. I have a cat, for example, that was, um, her mama died moving the kittens across the street on Segan Lane and they rushed them at, into the ER a couple of years, well, several years back and they called me in the middle of the night to come get the litter because the mom was dead. So I took the litter. To this day, Bunny is a chest sitter. She will sit on my chest, but the minute I touch her, she's, I'm gone. So. If I'm going to enjoy Bunny on my chest, it's not like that cat in Karen's arms. It's I'm going to lay on your chest and then I'm gone if you touch me. So the answer to that is you can't mold them. You can work your best to let them choose it. And how would you do that? Well, every time they come near you, you would not force them. You would allow them to choose it and you would give them a treat, give them a reward. So again, the cat is easily bribable for the most part. But if there's not something greater in them that's going to make them want to come to you and stay there, they're not going to. You can't make them. Um, does fur length have any impact on the temperament? So not so much fur length, but there is studies out there that coat colors do. So there's actually some research that shows, and it's, it, there's only one or two papers, guys, so it's not proven by any means, okay? When I say research, there are research that's proven, and this one is not. But ginger cats tend to have a little less tolerability for human um, handling, gingers in general. And then, of course, we all know those calicos and those torty coat colors. In, through, through some studies, genetically, it's showing that those three coat colors probably do have some issues. There's in, there is some studies that say any allele of the tabby um, including black because they're not black. Remember, they're washed out tabbies, right? They're, black is not really a color. Um, if you look at them in the sunlight, you'll see some tabby markings, but those cats may be a little bit more amendable to handling and loving and those sorts of things. So, and then there are some breeds. And through breeding and adaptation that way, there are certainly some breeds that are really amendable to loving and lap cats and things like that. So, so those are the, the answers to those questions. Um, how common is feline herpes virus and what is the human equivalent? Well, feline herpes virus is an alpha DNA virus. It's feline herpes virus one and it is very common. About 99% of kittens are gonna come in contact with that virus. I think it's almost virtually impossible to keep them free of it. Very similar to the coronavirus, not talking about COVID-19, I'm talking about feline coronavirus. It is almost impossible unless they live in a bubble to, to them not to be amenable to it. The vaccination is anywhere from 60 to 80% effective, and it also depends on the individual cat's immune system. And it, um, it's varied, okay? So it very much depends on the individual cat's immune system, the age that they get vaccinated, do they mount an immune response or not. And remember, a vaccination prevents disease not infection it prevents disease herpes virus just like in people there's really only one species of animal that we haven't found the herpes virus officially in and the last i checked the research i think this is true but i don't study dogs anymore is the caimic bovine herpes virus equine herpes virus mouse monkey cat but not the dog yet unless the research has recently changed because i just don't read it anymore so 
that'll help with that. Kittens with parasites, what is the best way to clean the home in their area to have the best results? Most parasites are fecal oral contaminated. So you need to have extreme good, and, and this is important with kittens in general because sanitation is so important. But it's very important that you just keep things clean. Wash your hands. You can be a source of transmission of parasites to kittens. Fomites are a source, your hands, gloves, etc. Keep things clean. Wash your hands. Change the litter regularly. If you have kittens, if I have a kitten that has diarrhea, I'm dumping that box every single day and I'm cleaning it. I'm not necessarily bleaching it. I'm cleaning it with good soap and water and I'm putting it in the sunlight because guess what doesn't like sunlight? A lot of parasites, they don't like sunlight, they desiccate in the sunlight, and that includes viruses as well. So keeping things clean. How can you tell if a pair of kittens is a bonded pair, and is that only in litter mates? So research out there will show you that it is predominantly in litter mates, okay? It is not common to get a bonded pair of cats that are not genetically related. It has happened, it's not common. And just because they're bonded, follow me here, because this is very important. I think a lot of people get upset this way, and it is, it is okay, it is one thing if they're bonded as kittens, that does not mean they're gonna stay bonded as adults. Cats reach social maturity between ages two and four. That's when they become who they're going to become. So kittens that are bonded as kittens, may change that as two-year-olds and then choose to live a solitary life. Because generally speaking, the cat is a solitary species. So it's very difficult to, tear, to tell, and I think it's almost impossible to tell whenever they're in a homing center because it could totally change when they get out and it could totally change when they become an adult. How do they know how to use a litter box? Instinct, magic, all three. Well, it comes back to their predecessors back 9,000 years ago. Um, they're going to use, and this goes back to toileting and optimization of the litter box. They're going to use a soft, fine substrate in a large open area where they can see everything while they're avoiding because they are a species of prey and they're hypervigilant and they need to make sure they're not going to get killed while they're going to the litter box. That is why constipation and holding of the urine and urinary tract disease will occur in a home where there's four to five cats and only two litter boxes. Because if somebody's resource guarding and staring, resource guarding is as simple as laying near the litter box and looking at it. That is a perceived threat and some cats will not use that litter box. And I've seen more constipation and bowel issues as well as holding of the urinary bladder in multi-cat households where there's only a few resources, okay? So they know, and usually what I do with these little kittens is, at about three to four weeks of age, when I'm hand rearing kittens, I'm gonna put a little tiny pie dish in there with some very, very fine litter. My favorite litter to use with my babies is Kitten Attract. I like Dr. Elsie's Kitten Attract. I only like it because it's fine, fine, fine. And I find that when one gets it, then the whole litter follows and it goes by smell. Because remember I told you olfaction, they release chemicals in their urine that tells messages to enter cat to the species of the cat. So when one figures it out, they all get it. If I have a litter of kittens that's not figuring it out, and I have had that, then about three weeks of age, I start to stimulate them in the litter box, in that fine litter. It's a little messy, yes, but that's how I'll train them if they don't figure it out. I put them in the litter box, I give them the little cotton ball stimulation, to where one goes, I leave it in there because they're gonna smell it and they're gonna eventually start to figure it out. So yes, the answer is sometimes it's magic because they just know it's ingrained, it's just ingrained in them. And then sometimes it's a mama because the mama's gonna use a certain substrate and then all the little kittens are gonna follow. So that's how that happens. Okay, so it seems like the incidence of FIP in kittens is increasing. Is this true and is that related to stress at all? And the answer to your question is absolutely. So we know that in controlling of FIP, there are things, and FIP, let's go back to what FIP is. Feline enteric coronavirus is a very mild coronavirus that infects the, line, that infects the GI tract of the cat, okay? 80% of these guys, including when we see them in the homing center, we have no symptoms. And in fact, when I do diarrhea panels because I'm looking for something else on a cat, 
I'm going to see coronavirus positive. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's almost impossible not to have it. These guys get over it and nothing happens. But let's talk about when that virus converts. And there are multiple strains of coronavirus. That's why it's very difficult to develop a vaccination for a coronavirus. It mutates. It's an RNA virus. It's not well established like the herpes virus that has not mutated virtually anything in hundreds of years. Coronavirus is very, very, very unstable. It's not a very smart virus. It's an RNA virus. It mutates. So just when you think you have something for one, guess what? Bam, it mutates and you don't. So think about that when you're talking, when you're thinking about the viruses. But anyway, we've been dealing with coronavirus in cats since 1965 or a few years earlier. So it's been a long time. So that virus in the right immune system or immune deficiency at the right time, the right temperature mutates in an individual cat. It has not been shown to be contagious, the FIP virus. Coronavirus is contagious, but not FIP. So it mutates and becomes virulent FIP. And we see that in shelters. Average acceptable percentage, in my opinion, it's not acceptable, but average acceptable percentage is 4 to 10%. 4 to 10% is acceptable. Why? Because of crowding conditions. The only way is to have a good immune system. And the only thing we as humans can do to stop coronavirus is decrease crowding. The other thing we're finding is there is a genetic predisposition to it. That is why we see it a lot in purebreds. There is a genetic predisposition and research is out there that it may be linked to the paternal lines. That is not hard fast facts. That was recently released whenever I did the FIP conference with Dr. Peterson this year is that it may be able to be traced back to the paternal lineage. And we don't know why that is. So when we're working with controlling FIP, I see waves of it when I'm dealing with the shelter and, and then I see waves of it in purebreds. In purebreds, there's no particular wave. It just happens at regardless. Sometimes there's a big stressful event that happens and then boom, it comes out. But in my shelter environment, when kitten season has reached its peak and everybody's coming back to the shelter for adoption, right around, let's say, August, July, bam, I'm going to start diagnosing FIP. And it's just the way it is. It's, it's just that way. And acceptable-wise, again, I said nothing is acceptable to me. But I have to accept 4 to 10% is realistic okay so decrease crowding we um how can you decrease crowding dr lacy in the shelter where there's a ton of kittens environmental enrichment playing with the kittens having your fosters go in there and do some environmental enrichment play with the mouse with them do something other than feed them change their litter and leave them programs those are the things you can do to help slow that down is it true that you shouldn't touch kittens whose mom is still around? Will that make them abandon them? If so, at what age is it okay to handle them? And what age should the kittens be before you TNR the mom? So the answer to that question is yes and no. If you are dealing with a feral mom that has had kittens, and I have a client that has reached out to me right now that is dealing with that, if you have a feral mom that has had kittens, it is best not to touch because of the fact that that group scent and the smell is so important to everybody at least in the first week at least in the first week now if the mom is feral remember back to the stress and she releases the stress through her milk as well so remember what we talked about if the mom is not set up to accept human intervention then it's probably best to leave that mom alone usually the mom's gonna Keep, gonna not abandon them but if you see that the mom is kicking one out of the nest and you want to obviously get it back to the mom because the survival rate of a kitten is much higher if mom raises it then you would want to take something from the nest that smells like mom and the other kittens and rub it on that kitten and put it back and see if it would accept so you want to do some minimal handling if at all possible and if you're hand rearing kittens I think you should start handling them soon, but cautiously. So I would start handling them around two weeks of age, really handling them. Besides 
just cleaning them and making sure that they're okay, which in the sense if you're if you have a mom living with you and you're and she's raising the kittens, spot cleaning is best because you really just don't want to disrupt that group scent. Okay. So cleaning is should be minimal, just keep the defecation and urination and stuff down. So what age to handle them? You can start at two weeks of age and you can start in short bouts of handling them as long as it doesn't stress mom. So what I would suggest if you're doing that is offer mom some food, some wet food or something she doesn't normally get and start petting the kittens because guess what happens at that point? The kittens are looking to mom. They're going, a human's touching me. Mom, are you stressed? They're watching mom's ears. They're watching mom's tail. They're watching mom's fur. They're watching mom's eyes and they're watching mom's whiskers because that's all telling those kittens something. They're also releasing, mom's releasing pheromones. And so those kittens are saying, okay, bing, 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 stress, or mom's eating, she's purring, you're touching the kittens. That is excellent. That's a happy, happy situation. Short bouts, multiple times of day. It is, it studies, it is shown that kittens handled by four to five different handlers for about 40 minutes a day in short increments makes them well adjusted and well amendable to handling later on, okay? So at what age should the kittens be before you TNR the mom? I think that it's important to probably get them to weaning. So they need to at least, mom's gonna start weaning those kittens between roughly around, some start as early as four, but roughly between five to six weeks, mom's gonna start weaning them. The bad news is, is mom's probably already pregnant again. So it's just the way it is. Mom, cats are seasonally polyesterous. They are induced ovulators. They are the species. They breed and they go into estrus with long daylight hours and decreased melatonin. And I've actually used melatonin implants in some cats to take them out of estrus in a safe way besides using like the hormones because hormones have so many side effects later down the line. So I've actually um, incorporated that into some cats that I've taken, helped take care of people. Got that from Europe. We put in 18 milligram melatonin implants, which is totally benign in the moms. So like a microchip takes them out of estrus most of them, not all of them. And so we know that daylight length brings them into heat. They can go into heat every two weeks or so. They can be pregnant for multiple times at one time because when they're accepting, they're accepting. They'll accept one time, they'll accept another time. And we know that in studies, it shows that a mom will accept multiple times, multiple times when she's stressed out. And the reason is, is because survival of the species her job is to procreate and make kittens that survive so the species will continue. So if mom is stressed, resources are thin, she might be pregnant for three times at one time. It happens. That's why they're born with so many different colors all the time. It's usually associated with that. That's why there's a runt in some litters because maybe they're not the runt, they're just about a week younger than the rest of them. So TNR the mom, most people say it's safe to start TNR when the kittens are about six weeks of age. Um, I'm interested in adopting a little cat who has cerebellar hypoplasia and is deaf. Oh, that's cool. Fred's that way. They said he got the condition in utero from having likely feline parvovirus, panleukopenia. He gets along with other cats, but what special considerations are needed in the home and would he be a carrier? Actually, the opposite. Cats that are affected with feline panleukopenia, do, we do feel they develop a lasting immunity. So actually, if you never vaccinated it again, they'd probably be vaccinated. And they also become a great donor of plasma. If you ever end up having a litter of kittens that gets parvovirus, they can donate because they'll have natural antibodies to it. So feline parvovirus is also known as feline panleukopenia virus. And that is exactly why Fred is the way Fred is. He was my fosters last year. Um, he got infected with parvovirus at three to four weeks of age when his cerebellum was developing because the neurosystem of the kitten develops way into way after birth. That's why they twitch so much when they're little. That's normal. They're supposed to twitch. So Fred got it. It attacked his cerebellum. It quit growing. So Fred is off. He can't, but I will say this, he can't be declawed and I can't trim his claws. I have to tolerate that he uses... He literally hangs on from the highest of perches. He can get up and down any perch in my house. I'd be happy to show you videos. He's hilarious, but literally I think half the time he's going to kill himself. 
because he's hanging on by a thread and he has no idea of spatial distancing, but he's hanging on and he climbs up and down perches as long as there's a sizzle substrate for him to climb. My, my furniture shredded, my clothes get ruined. It is what it is. When I first got him home, he did not know how to drink water. I had to teach him that. He had no idea how to eat food because he couldn't stop bobbing. So he put his food in the hard, he put his face in the hard food and he would constantly do this and he would just give up. That's why he couldn't drink water. I think he always felt like he was drowning. So as he grew up, he gradually adapted to it. But I have a cerebellar hypoplasia feeder that I used. And what I did was, because he couldn't drink water, I gave, he had all his, he had about seven canned food meals a day with extra water added so that he could get nutrition. And then all of a sudden one day I saw him drinking out of a water fountain. He can't do a bowl. He still can't do a bowl. He drowns in a bowl, but he can in a water fountain. And then one day I saw him eating hard food and then the rest is history. He still prefers soft food, but he will eat hard food. But I can definitely, definitely on another note, take you through that from start to finish what I went through with him and how he's doing and he's doing excellent. We had to have special litter boxes for him, but then he figured out how to learn it. It just sounds like a tornado is going through the litter box when he uses it. And I have to have high sides because there is litter everywhere if you let him it took him a while to figure out how to clean it he still doesn't bathe himself very well i have to brush i have to wipe him down occasionally and thank gosh that wraith bathes him so i don't have to do that but i would be happy to go through that with you absolutely that is probably one of my favorite topics now because i have one mortality rate in kittens is 95 percent and in my litter they all died except for fred and that's it. And he was the sickest. I don't know how he lived, but he lived and he lives on. So I'm super happy about that. We've been bottle feeding four kittens now over four to five weeks of old. And one of them does not want to stop bottle feeding. She's ignoring any attempts to weaken or trick her into weaning. Her four siblings are taking a wet food like a cat to tuna. So I run into this. I've bottle raised since 1996. I think if I would ask Steven, I've probably had over hundred bottle kittens come in my life and every single one is different. I'm sorry, they're all different. I've had some that would not get off the bottle until they were almost 10 weeks of age. I've had some that get off the bottle at three weeks of age. I've had some that want to wean straight to canned food. I've had some that I had to make a nasty gruel. I've had some that I had to finger it into their mouth. I've had some, I've had all sorts. Don't stress about tulip. Tulip is still very young. Mama cat is not gonna force her kittens to wean till seven to eight weeks of age. And some cats, I have one group of cats that is a, um, she's a great breeder and her kittens stay on those mamas till 10, 11 weeks, some of them. So you know what? Mama doesn't push them. And again, you don't want to cause stress in her because I always say the two most critical times in a kitten's life, and I try to tell my Cat Haven um, caretakers this, and I think this is important for everybody to know, the first week of life and week four. Why week four? Because that's when everybody wants those kittens off the bottle and out the house because it's annoying, you're tired, it's frustrating, you want them weaned. Unfortunately, if you force them, their immune system goes down, they get sick. So I see them come in. They're going to come into me crashing at week one or week four. And so don't force her. Keep giving her the bottle. Keep offering it before each feeding. Wait till she's good and hungry. Keep offering it, keep working it, maybe try changing it up. What I found with my kittens that don't want to get off the bottle is, is I take, I use, for me, what I use weaning is I use Royal Canaan mother cat baby food and kitten food because it's a moose and I, I'm not a, there's absolutely no endorsements coming from me here. I have no, it's just what I choose. I just like it. I have absolutely, there's nothing wrong with Science Diet. There's nothing wrong with Purina. I just go to mom and baby and just because it's easy. So what I'll take with my hard to wean kittens is, is I will get a little bit of mousse and I'll put a lot of formula in there. I'll warm it because the cat's taste buds are actually activated at about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So they need to be a little warm. I'll put it down and I'll let the kitten sniff it a little bit. I'll kind of scoop it up with my finger and just wipe it on their mouth let them lick it. And a lot of times they'll eventually take to that. So don't stress about it too much. Just know that. And when I send you guys my orphan kitten booklet, 
it talks about troubleshooting weaning and what do you do, but four to five weeks is still young, so I wouldn't stress over it one bit. She will figure it out. Trust me, I've had some, I was like, is this kitten gonna ever get off the bottle? I'm so tired of waking up. And they eventually get off the bottle. So let's see if I've answered everybody's questions. Yeah, Fred does need to make an appearance. Right now I have a cat, I have Boots in my, in my office with me. Boots is somebody that's living at Cat Care Center right now until he gets adopted. He had um, some bladder issues and was relinquished. So we have a Boots here. Okay, is there any other questions that I can answer for you guys? Anything at all? I'm gonna send you guys a bunch of information. Um, a bunch of the genetic stuff and the scientific stuff we talked about from the beginning, that is more from me talking to you. I don't have a handout written about all that, but it does cover little bits and pieces of it in my different handouts. Um, I'm going to send you one on socialization, the checklist, orphan kittens, how to decrease stressors before kittens arrival, a guide to providing enrichment for queen and promoting kitten welfare. So I'll send that. I think that's very helpful. I'm gonna send, let's see what else. I'm gonna send um, a kitten socialization and habituation program that I wrote. And um, I'm actually, I'm gonna turn this over to Cat Haven at, uh, soon and let them have that too. I'm also gonna send you um, a handout I wrote on selecting the perfect kitten. You know, what, what, what should you look for? And a lot of that, you know, people go into the homing center and they want a certain type of kitten. Well, this will kind of have some questions that you can ask. And then there's also, you know, questions about feral cat socialization. And then I'm also going to send you the process of weaning because if you read the process of kitten weaning on how mom does it, you'll understand why it's important, if at all possible, to leave kittens with moms. Fleas and kittens. These four had hundreds on them to the point we had to give Capstar and baths and tweezers. Is there a best method to getting them off with tweezers? Seems difficult. So one thing I do is um, I do Dawn baths in all of my kittens if they're covered in fleas. And you can do a Dawn bath every day if you have to, as long as you warm them back up, okay? Um, the other thing I do is Frontline. Frontline is safe. Frontline spray is safe for neonates, firstborn kittens. Frontline spray on a cotton ball, and you can gently rub it on the kitten. The most important thing is, is it's cold, so you got to make sure they're warm after that. Um, Capstar, a lot of people will give Capstar. You can do that, but what I do, and it's off-label use, but I've been doing it since, 19, since 1998, and I never have a problem, is I get the kitten advantage kitten advantage and I put about a drop on each kitten and I have done that at birth I am not kidding because in my house I'm like the one rule in my house is I will raise you and I will love you but thou shalt not bring fleas into my home <laughs> so I'm like I've been doing it I've never had a problem and I've done it on hundreds and hundreds of kittens including Fred poor Fred Fred's litter was one day old they were two days old when I got them and every last one of them got um advantage so it says not to be used in kittens six weeks of age, but again, and that's just because it hasn't been studied and they didn't pay the millions of dollars to get it studied, but Frontline did. So if you're looking for a, a product that has been studied, Frontline. I would never put Revolution Plus or Brevecto, none of the lawners. That is way too strong and I would probably kill them if I did that, but I have no problem putting... Um, I even have put a drop of regular revolution when I was in a pinch, but I always, always, always keep kitten advantage in my um, supply case. I have a neonatal ICU set up at home with an incubator, oxygen environment, all of those things for those little neonatal ones. I've kind of transitioned over the years from bottle raising litters. Now that I'm here at Cat Care Center and working so much, I can't sleep. I have to sleep some at night or else I'm no good for anybody during the day. But what I do do is I help clients and I help Cat Haven with those really, really sick kittens that need tube feeding and meds and, you know, the critical ones that are, that are likely going to die. And I usually do my best to save them if I can. Some of them I lose anyway, but I'll do my best. So that's kind of what I've transitioned to and then training others to do it because I think it's, I think it's fun. I loved it. Um, you said they develop temperament two to four years. I always thought six months. You know the temperament. Please clarify. 
So it's at, they, they do not reach social maturity till about two years of age. So they can change their temperaments and what they're willing to like up till they're a little bit older. Yeah. So six months is a good indication, but I've had cats that were six months still playful and loving to cuddle. And then at two years of age, they're solitary. So it's actually closer to social maturity and it can be late and it can be as late as four years in some cats. But I would say two is your safely is your safe cutoff. Again, six months, you have a good indication. The best, the best way is to know the dad, the mom, and was this kitten an orphan? Those are your best. Now, how many times, all of us in rescue, how many times do we know that? Never. So you're sort of just going off of an intuition and a feeling. Um, can you describe a crash course on tube feeding? Yes, I can. So I have a handout on this with a YouTube video, and I'll be happy to attach that. I think that it's a whole lot scarier than it really is. And when you're in a pitch and your kitten's going to die, this is what I try to teach everybody that I'm teaching on tube feeding. I try to teach them that your kitten's going to die if you do nothing. Your kitten's going to die. If you make a mistake, you did the best you could. But your kitten's going to die if you do nothing. So the most important thing is this, I select a five, a five, a three and a half to five French red rubber feeding tube. I use, depending on, I make sure they're warm because a kitten that is not warm will not have an active gut and they will aspirate and they will not process. They'll get diarrhea, they'll, they'll be sick. So you gotta have them warm, gotta have their gut moving. If it's the first feeding, I don't tube feed formula, I tube feed sugar water or dextrose in water or I tube feed formula that is at least 50% diluted, predominantly water, and I also feed half of the stomach volume. And I'm gonna send you this in your handout, but the stomach volume of a kitten is four to five mils per 100 grams. Four to five mils per 100 grams. If they were starving and they were almost dead, then I'd never put more than one and a half to two mils at a time, and I'd go back in two hours. But basically, you always want to measure your tube from the mouth, to the last rib and mark it. I always have a syringe. You want to go down the left side of the kitten's mouth and you want to have them elevated. Again, I'm gonna email, I will add that handout, send my tube feeding handout. And I'm more than happy to teach this. I taught a class on tube feeding last year to Cat Haven and I'm absolutely more than happy to do it again. Once CCC's doors opening, you guys can send questions in to help at any time and I'm doing my best to keep up, but I'm more than happy to teach another class. Anyway, Kitten, I usually wrap mine in a warm blanket. I always end up doing this at night by myself. I don't have help from anybody, and when they're feeling good, they start to wiggle, so it's really hard. But when they're sick, they don't have a supple, supple reflex. So you have a measure tube, you go down the left side. Once you get the tube in place, you attach your syringe, and you, before you push it, you aspirate back. If you get negative pressure, you're in the stomach. If you get positive pressure, you're in the lungs. If you get positive, if you get air, pull out and redirect, do not direct it. If you're scared and you're not sure, you can always, always, always push some, some saline in first because that's how we do bronchoalveolar lavages is we in infuse saline that will cross the alveolus and be gone in no time. So you won't cause any harm. If you were to push saline and they cough, you're in the trachea, come out. So you go down the left side, you put your syringe on, you aspirate back. If you get negative pressure, you're safe. You push it slowly over a minute if you possibly can. The rule is two to five minutes. Yeah, that's not happening at two o'clock in the morning with a wiggling kitten. I can't tell you how many two fed kittens, including Rafe, who is a fabulously healthy kitten. I got two fed in 30 seconds because I couldn't do it by myself and it worked fine. So push it in and then on the way out, aspirate back for negative pressure so you can suck what's left up in the end of the tube so that it doesn't go into the larynx and into the trachea and pull it right out and then look at the stomach if it's a little fat belly and it's a quiet contented kitten, that kitten's been too fed, put it back and let it go to sleep. So I have a handout on that. Going to a drive-by graduation, thank you so much. Have a good time. Is it possible for Queenie to become less nervous and less reactive by the time she reaches social maturity? <sighs> Probably not, but that doesn't mean there's not some things we can do for her. I am not a fan of medication in the cat if we can control the environment and things like that. But there are some cats 
where I do consider anti-anxiety at low doses because it is um, having a cat that is unable to cope with their, their, their environment and cope with um, their stress and their anxiety is not healthy for them. So I will, that is a conversation you and I can have. And I have a lot of cats like her and I have a lot of cats that I've put on some anxiety, some anti-anxiety at low doses and it has made a huge difference in those cats. Okay. So don't give up on her. We can certainly talk about it. She may, but she's also that coat color. Remember we talked about, and she was an orphan and yeah, so it might be hard, but don't worry. I have one of those cats too now, so it's okay. Okay. Are there any other questions guys? And feel free, you guys can email me. I don't, I've got a lot of emails lately. So sometimes I don't get to answer in 24 hours. Like I used to, I always try to answer my sick, my clients that email with sick questions, especially on the weekends. I check my help email or my Dr. Lacey email twice a day at least. And I try to answer as many questions as I possibly can. But if I can't, but if it's a question that can wait and I have others to answer ahead, I'll do that. But I do make, I do make notes of everybody's questions. So there's going to be a lot of attachments that I'm going to email to all of you. Um, and for those that couldn't attend, we'll get those out to you as well. Any questions? I, I think one hour is way too short to answer questions on kittens. So if you guys want to, we can do another kitten talk. I have a lot of people that are wanting to talk about behavior. They're wanting to talk about allergies, kidney, and kidney disease. There's so many topics in the future that um, we're going to talk about. And literally, I just what happens is, is I just put it out to the universe. What topic should I talk about? And then boom, I wake up in the middle of the night and there's the topic. And I was like, literally, that's how this was born. I was contemplating. I was like, should I talk about this? I, so many people wanted about this. And it was like, I kept getting an innate feeling and it was no, no, no. And then kitten season is upon us right now. Um, real quick, I do want to cover a topic that everybody sees called fading kitten syndrome. So fading kitten syndrome is a syndrome. It is not a disease. It is not an infection. It is not a thing. It is not a particular thing. It is a conglomerate of things that we see. Um, when they're fading kitten syndromes in the first few days of life, it is usually that the mom had them early. They're low birth weight kittens below 90 grams. Um, they may have a different blood type from the mom. So they were, if they ingested that first colostrum and that first milk, then guess what? they're gonna have antibodies to their own blood. So I've seen kittens bleed out and die the first week or two of life, especially if it's a type A kitten born to a type B queen. So that's really important. Blood typing is super important in the cat. Um, the other thing I'll see is when the kittens pass through the urogenital tract of the mother, just like in humans, they always test us right before we deliver for strep. Kit, cats carry strep as well as E. coli, as well as a bunch of other stuff in their vulvovaginal tract. So when these kittens pass through it, if they're stressed, if they have a decreased immune system, they're going to be harboring some bacteria and they might be harboring it quite well until one day they're a little stressed for some reason, they got cold. Let's say they got hypothermic or let's say one of the kittens pushed them out of the nest or something like that, um, then they're going to be susceptible. And so what I see, my number one sickness that I see associated with fading kitten syndrome is usually septicemia. And so I usually jump on these guys pretty darn quickly and the fosters that contact me with, with fading kittens. And the first sign you're going to see is a day where they don't gain weight. And then that may go into two days and maybe they're not eating and they're, and you need to jump on those kittens because they will die in a few hours. I, I, I can't explain it. Their metabolic rate is about, okay. So the moms, so the average cat's metabolic rate is about 60 mils per kick, 45 to 60 mils per kick per day. The kittens is 130 to 200 mils per kick per day. One bout of diarrhea, dehydration, fading kittens. Um, the other thing is, is their, met their metabolic rate is literally three times as high for more, more than three times. They don't have compensatory mechanisms. They can't shiver and show you fever till at least one week of age. Um, the other thing about them is, is if they don't eat, they need 50 kilocals per gram per, per 100 grams per meal, I mean, per day. So if they're not eating, then guess what? They're, they're going to die. And it's and one mil is one kilocal. So that's a lot in a day, plus the water requirements. So that's why they die. They drop in hours. And it's true. I have fosters come in every year and say they were fine this morning, and then now they're halfway dead. 
Absolutely. And when I'm bolusing these kids, guys, it's really scary. Pediatric medicine has been something I've done over the last couple of years. When I'm bolusing these kids, I may have a six ounce kitten and I'm giving IV seven to eight mils IV. That's a lot of fluid for a six ounce kitten. And that's just to get their heart pumping again, because they're about to die. Their heart rate is about 230 beats per minute when they're born and their respiratory rate is between 18 and 20 breaths per minute. So if you have a kitten that is breathing at 40 to 60, that kitten needs to be seen. Those guys are sick. So just little milestones. I have all that in my handouts. So I will get that to you guys. Most of, some of you guys already have it, but I'll get that to you. So any other questions or are you guys good? I hope you have a happy Mother's Day, everybody. I love the topic of kittens. We can definitely talk about kittens. We can go through, I mean, there could be an hour spent on each week of life in the kitten and what's important and what can happen. But I think this was a good overall to get started. So I hope y'all have a good weekend. If I don't have any more questions, then we'll get off the line. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye. I had fun. Thank y'all for, thank y'all for attending. I have fun doing these. When it hits me to do it, I'm like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun for me. I love to, I, I love to talk. I, as you can tell, I have no voice. And this week I talked a lot. So I think that's why. Have a good weekend. Have a good Mother's Day. Enjoy your fur babies. Enjoy your kittens. And I'll see you guys next month. Bye. Bye. Okay.